Hello and a warm welcome to the CNBC Africa special in partnership with GSMA. I'm Gugule Tutele coming to you from Cape Town. Now would you believe me if I told you that Sub-Saharan Africa is the third largest market open to the mobile economy? Well according to the latest GSMA report on the mobile economy, this stands true where Sub-Saharan Africa is only second to Latin America or rather third to Latin America together with Europe. But to tell us more about this as well as the overall theme and environment for enabling a mobile economy. I'm joined in studio by Michael O'Hara, who's the Chief Marketing Officer at GSMA. Good to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. Perhaps let's pick up on the theme and definition of this digital economy or mobile economy. I think so often we introduce words interchangeably like e-commerce and the e-mobile environment, but uh, what does it actually mean when it comes to a mobile economy? Yeah, so for me, I would take it up even a level above all of that. I, I think if you look at the world, uh, we have about 7 billion people in the world. We only have about a billion fixed communication lines in the world. So if you want to connect the world's population together, the technology has to be mobile. If you want to then enable the world's population to get online and use the internet again, it has to be mobile. And if you want to create that next generation of innovation, those innovators have to be working and living a mobile world. I think I use the expression mobile is everything and that definitely applies in this sense. So unless I can carry it in my back pocket or in my handbag, it's probably going to be irrelevant in the future. Yeah, exactly. I, I think uh, I'll steal a line from Google uh, that they used at Mobile World Congress a couple of years ago whenever they said everything they do is mobile first. Mm -hmm. You've got to think in a mobile context if you want to live and survive in this modern world. Coming back to the report, uh, when I read the first statement that uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is only third uh, in the world as a mobile market economy, it didn't actually make sense to me because I thought surely we must be competing with more developed environments like Latin America, Europe and even the US. But what are some of the contributing factors that are creating this enabling environment? Well, I think it's going well. Um, so we certainly have scale here uh, around about 700 million connections um, versus a population that's approaching a billion. Mm. So you kind of look at those numbers and go, hey, people are getting connected here. The reality is kind of a little bit less than that. Um, only 380. 380 million subscribers. Uh, so around about 40% of the population of Sub-Saharan Africa actually have a mobile service. That means we've got a lot of work still to do. So there's been immense growth. Um, as you say, Africa's in a great position, but there's an awful lot to do to get people online and to get them taking advantage of that transformative power that mm -hmm. mobile can be. And I understand that there's uh, significant growth prospects as we look ahead to the year 2020. But maybe if we break it down from a regulatory perspective or maybe starting with uh, government policies, do we have the correct policies in place to actually enable an environment that will cultivate the kind of growth that we're hoping to see in the next five years? Yeah, so I think a couple of things. I think the progress has been good and I think we feel very, very confident in that. I think as you start to try and unlock um, connecting the unconnected, those people probably in rural areas, uh, there are a number of things that we think are really important. Uh, the first one is probably around the digital dividend, that is it's called. Yes. Uh, that's closing down the old analog television and making that spectrum available for mobile services. Uh, I think the ITU set a deadline of around about April 2015 to release that spectrum uh, mm -hmm. across sub-Saharan Africa. That's progressing, but probably needs to progress a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. I think the importance of that is if you use television uh, frequencies, they have range. So you can get coverage really, really well. So you can reach out into those rural areas and get people online. A um, couple of other things that I think are important. The ability to infrastructure share um, is important. Uh, so making the business case more attractive for people as they, uh, as they address this market, uh, I think is an important area. And then probably financial incentives uh, in a couple of ways. Um, so incenting the build out uh, of the networks to reach the rural population, maybe even as simple as reducing tariffs on equipment coming in uh, mm -hmm. to the countries to allow people to again make a better business case. Uh, and taxation uh, plays a big role. Uh, mobile is very heavily taxed uh, in some of these emerging markets and I think we need to do some work at reducing that tax burden, 
getting the connections up, which of course then drives GDP in a positive direction, so ultimately helps countries. Mm. You touched on infrastructure development, and I'm hoping we can get delve into that just a little mm. bit further, despite the fact that you don't represent a mobile company. Mm. But according to the report, again, mobile operators in sub-Saharan Africa spent $9 billion in network infrastructure development just in 2014, which I understand is a, a significant increase in capital versus right. a year ago. Right. So shouldn't we be finding confidence in this? Yeah, no, we should, right? So revenue News are about 40 billion. Capital or CapEx is around about 9 to 10 billion. So that's a pretty healthy percentage if you compare that to a more developed uh, mm -hmm. market. Um, where I think you would, you'd see certainly a little bit lower, maybe 15%, you're at about 25% investment here. Um, that reflects operators trying to build out those networks and reach uh, the population and also start to roll out broadband for the first time. Um, broadband penetrations here again are low. Mm -hmm. uh, I think about 24% across the continent. 4G, which is of course uh, that next generation, is only around about 1% penetration. So a lot of work to do still to build out that broadband capacity, get people really living the mobile internet and allow them to use that to enhance their lives. Mm -hmm. On that low penetration though, Michael, do you think perhaps that there's a best practice that we can learn from some of our international counterparts? Or is it more tricky given the fact that there's a lot of spatial inequality in the African context? Right, I, th I think that's right and that then comes back to that conversation about making the right spectrum available, uh, that spectrum that has the reach. Um, in a lot of developed uh, regions, if you like, uh, populations are very much centred on the city so you mm. can use a different type of spectrum that gives you capacity but less range. I think the key here is that we get that digital dividend made available that, that lets you reach out to those rural populations. And then incent, right? It's really, really important we incent to get people onto the internet. I think about 23% of the people in sub-Saharan Africa have internet access today. Um, getting that number up to, I think, 33% globally, so we're trailing globally. Getting that number up and getting people into a position to take advantage of that mm -hmm. is really key. So again, goes back to uh, availability, maybe pricing, but I know that's not an area where uh, you would obviously be able to comment. But maybe you can comment with regard to uh, the role as well of institutions and perhaps where else this uh, investment incentive needs to be coming from. Are, are we seeing, you know, maybe uh, small town developers and, and even uh, uh, business incubators forming a base where we uh, see more an, of an active participation in the uh, mobile economy? Yeah, so I think you, you create a cycle. So as you, as you enable that mobile broadband capability, that 3G and 4G capability, you allow entrepreneurs to develop uh, effectively using the, I'm sure you've heard this expression many times, but the cloud and the power of cloud computing mm -hmm. to create really compelling applications. Uh, there's no reason why the next Google or Facebook should not come out of this region. Uh, I think what mobile does is allows you to reach global scale. Um, by connecting to that mobile internet, you immediately have reached billions of customers across the world. Mm. So enabling that infrastructure, putting people in sub-Saharan Africa in a position to be the entrepreneurs that drive those new services in the future, and letting them run, letting them see what can be developed, creates wealth in the economy, allows the investment to continue, and you create that virtuous cycle that, uh, that hopefully leads to that 100% penetration. Exactly. I'm looking at this glass of water that's uh, placed next to us and uh, uh, naturally if there's a demand for us to take a sip, we do and that goes back to the consumer dynamics that we see on the uh, sub-Saharan African landscape. Mm -hmm. What are we seeing unfolding there coming through from the report? Because I'm sure uh, the needs and the requirements in the market must be different to our peers in the developed economies. Uh, yeah, it is, but I think there's so much we can do with mobile technology and, and I think part of that is education. Um, I think helping people understand uh, the, the amazing capabilities that mobile can bring. Um, we've certainly seen great case studies in health where you're providing information to pregnant mothers on nutrition uh, mm. to help them uh, you know, look after their unborn children effectively. Um, finding information around uh, disease spread um, is, is definitely an area where mobile can play a role. Uh, if you move across into um, agriculture, um, being able to check crop prices, um, where the local markets are are case studies that we've definitely seen uh, play out very strongly, um, particularly in this region. So I think educating people as well as to what the capabilities are and the services that they can use their mobile for will again create the demand uh, mm -hmm. and have people come online 
and start to build businesses, which again feed that ecosystem. It almost sounds to me like you're deploying the Steve Jobs strategy, uh, giving consumers what they actually don't know they need. I think there's definitely a little bit of that, and I think part of that is education, right? I think part of that is getting people online for the first time and then helping them understand what's available, making sure good local content is available in local languages. Mm -hmm. I mean, the internet is very dominated by English language, so making sure there is good local content available online so people can learn, find out what's available to them, and then use that to grow their own businesses. Mm -hmm. I take it also understanding the uh, uh, culture and environment of transacting on the different uh, environments that might exist. Uh, and I'd like to draw an example to India, where I understand uh, they're very heavily based on, on cash as a society. Mm -hmm. But in Africa, we also have the opportunity of uh, leapfrogging some of these areas of development with mobile money. And we see some of that taking off on the continent here too. Yeah, it's definitely been a huge growth area. I, I think financial inclusion um, is something that mobile can absolutely help with. Uh, I think we have about 130 uh, mobile money deployments in Africa already, about 62 million active bank accounts or mobile money accounts uh, out there today. Um, we expect that to continue to grow. I think the next steps uh, in mobile money is interoperability. So these have grown up as little islands of innovation, little yes. mobile money services. Mm -hmm. Having those connect to each other uh, so people can share across networks and then ultimately share across countries will give you scale. Isn't that a headache for the regulators though? It is a headache, but it's important. Um, I think within a country, it's, it's a development of a market. Uh, I think people want to have a competitive advantage when they start to roll these services out, but I think with time, sharing and creating an interoperable, uh, interoperable service will actually grow the size of the market. And then the ability to, to span countries, and obviously you deal with the regulatory burden, but that certainly has um, great benefits for migrant workers working in different countries wanting to send money back to their families, mm -hmm. uh, those kind of services. So that's kind of the next phase, I would say, in mobile money, but absolutely Sub-Saharan Africa leads in that way. Mm -hmm. And when you uh, speak to some of your colleagues in the industry and those in the mobile game, uh, uh, does it almost seem as though can companies are merging? So you no, no longer have a telecoms play, and a financial services play, a, a content play, but there needs to be some kind of mergence between all three and even more. Yeah, and I think we've seen that more probably in, in some of these examples that you've talked about in Africa. In some of the developed markets, the, the divisions are stronger between a financial services company and a mobile company and you see a little bit less of that um, merging. I, I think that's a particularly strong trend uh, here in Sub-Saharan Africa. Is that because the more developed economies are have a stronger banking and financial services sector? <laughs> for good and for bad, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, we'll take a short air break, but we'll continue with our conversation more on the mobile economy following the GSMA release of data on that particular report. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> Welcome back. You're still watching the CNBC Africa special in partnership with GSMA on the back of their mobile economy report, which takes a key focus on sub-Saharan Africa, which is now highlighted as the third biggest market when it comes to this particular sphere. Now, just before the uh, ad break, Michael, we were touching on the regulatory headaches. And uh, uh, one of the areas that we touched on was uh, clearly a divergence or maybe uh, emergence of uh, a multi-pronged approach when it comes to uh, the offering of uh, mobile economy into uh, the uh, sub-Saharan African landscape, but uh, we mentioned very briefly that maybe the developed economy is slightly different given the fact that uh, certain areas of the sectors, financial services sectors in particular, are more mature. But in the sub-Saharan context of things, should we be uh, focusing maybe on a little bit more convergence and maybe uh, consolidation in the industry versus having more participants? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. I mean, I mean, I think the key here is to enable those business cases to allow people to invest. Uh, so I think uh, uh, consolidation is obviously important. Uh, in many cases, we have four or five operators uh, in a country. As um, a consumer, I think that's a good thing. Well, Pricing should be on my side. Well, it is an interesting point, right? Um, mm. But then investment uh, will struggle, right? So people will struggle to make the business case to reach out to those rural areas. Yeah. So there is a balance, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And where does that balance come? Um, is it probably around about the three operator level we think gives you a really nice level of competition, um, but also allows the business cases to work and the investments to go in to connecting the rural populations. 
Um, I think if you look at Europe as, a, as an example, there are many, many operators in some countries, small countries, uh, a lot of virtual network operators, and Europe has gone from a leadership position in mobile to one where the investment in 4G is really trailing behind the US and Asia. So it, it's a balance, I agree it's a balance because mm -hmm. you've got to be pro-consumer. But we do need to make sure we have the investments in place. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we also cultivate a, an area or environment as well for innovation? Because so often, like you say, you have the big boys who are the big players in this particular industry. And uh, oftentimes when uh, the one innovator comes out, either we steal the ideas or you know, pinch them, crush the idea. And on to the next one. Yeah, I think there's always a, a place for that innovative player. I mean, I mean, we've tr we typically see in a lot of the, the developed uh, economies, you have a couple of traditional players and you have a, a challenger brand, if you like, an innovative mobile operator coming into the area that's got new ideas uh, and is really challenging the ideas in the market. And, and I think there's definitely room for that. I, I don't think they necessarily get crushed. I think they actually help evolve the market in a positive direction in the mm -hmm. long run. On the topic of consolidation, mm. though, uh, in particular when it comes to the South African environment and against the rest of sub-Saharan Africa, we have a lot of fixed income players, fixed uh, line players, excuse me, and the key theme of our conversation actually is mobile. Mm. Should consolidation take place? Is there uh, an environment for the fixed players to stay to work in? I, I think it's I think it's a 50-50 on that one. I mean, I think for me, um, you know, again, back to that theme, mobile is everything. The way we're going to connect people is through mobile technology. I, I think the key for us is that we get the investment in mobile. Mm -hmm. We get mobile reaching out to people in those unconnected uh, areas and really get a, a big proportion uh, of people on the internet. Uh, I think fixed players certainly have a role to play in developed cities, bigger cities, uh, where that infrastructure was in place. But mobile, I think, is the future. And, and as you reach up into sort of 3G and ultimately 4G, 5G speeds, mm. you can do everything you can with a mobile connection that you could do with a fixed connection anyway. So it becomes quite powerful. Exactly. I wanted to draw a comparison to British uh, telecoms, if I'm not mistaken, but I'm not too sure if they're still on par uh, or with the rest of their colleagues uh, across the globe, though. Uh, so, so British Telecom, um, the original company, yeah. So they split, actually, uh, in the day. So, so BT was... a uh, a fixed player, uh, started the mobile arm, sold off the mobile arm, and has now invested again and bought a mobile player back in again. So you do get those consolidated players emerging uh, mm -hmm. in, in some of the developed markets. But again, I, I don't think that's the key here. I mean, I think the key for me is getting strong mobile players, really building their subscriber base, get the level of competition right, get the level of investment right, and then really connect people. Exactly. And maybe again, uh, to highlight the importance of mobile, coming to the GSMA report, it does seem as though it's a significant contributor to a, a gross domestic product. I understand the numbers for 2015 range between 5.7% uh, of GDP for uh, just last year. And in 2020, we're looking at 8% mm -hmm. uh, contribution to GDP. So this is quite huge. Yeah, it is huge, right? And that reflects positively versus a developed market. So you'd be looking at sort of in the high 3%, in a more developed market. So when you're up at about 5.7% uh, here in Sub-Saharan Africa, that's about $100 billion. So mm -hmm. it's a significant number. Is that because of the low base that we're starting from? Uh, but also probably reflects the importance of mobile versus fixed line players. So mobile is that infrastructure that's connecting people together and creating these opportunities and starting businesses and letting people get online. So I think that's the power that mobile can have. Mm -hmm. And again, driving that kind of growth and GDP growth through an economy is, is just a huge reason why making the spectrum available, getting those incentives in place to get the networks built out becomes so key. Exactly. Are our African states in sub-Saharan Africa getting this right though? Because it almost sounds like there's a correlation. Give them t uh, incentives, there's increased investment, you get increased tax income as well from these companies, which equals better growth for the right. economies. So the growth's been good. Um, you know, we've talked about how we, we've grown very quickly in this region. Uh, we've got a lot of people online. Now we're at that point where, where we really want a challenge and we really want to get more people online. I, I think our projection says that we'll have about 49% uh, of the continent, 49% um, uh, of people will have a subscription to mobile by 2020. I don't think that's yeah. enough, right? I think we've got to push now. Uh, if the incentives come in, uh, if we can get the spectrum available, maybe help operators share, work together, look even at some alternative technologies, 
and push into those rural areas, then I think we should be aiming at better than 49%. Uh, I, think, I think we probably owe that to the population here to get that up into the 60s and 70%. Would we ever reach a level of market saturation? It's a way to go. Right? It's quite a way to go. I mean, I mean, you can. I mean, you can, and you know, I'm, I'm sure in, in cities like uh, you know Cape Town or Johannesburg, you have something close to that. Probably even maybe over 100% penetration because people have multiple devices. Mm -hmm. uh, I think as a continent as a whole, I think we should have that 100% goal in our in our sites and see how we can get everyone connected for the first time. Exactly. If we also take a look at uh, the, some of the other socioeconomic benefits with regard to mobile as an economy, job creation, which we know is a stubborn problem on the African continent and yeah. across the globe, where we have this, uh, they call it the dividend, uh, uh, the youth dividend, or either like a, okay. a youth bulge that we have on the continent, okay. where over 75% of the African population is under the age of 35. Wow. So if we could see more jobs being created by 2020 yeah. on the back of mobile economy, I'm sure we could uh, again see significant amounts of growth and economic participation. Yeah, definitely. So mobile and mobile today accounts for probably about 4 million jobs across the region. I think that'll grow to about 6 million jobs uh, by 2020. But I, but I think you hit the key as to where the real growth comes from. Um, as you give people the ability to work on mobile broadband and start companies um, and innovate, and access the cloud and access global markets through that mobile broadband, mm -hmm. then the possibilities are endless of creating jobs. Uh, I think the other thing that's really key is they're, they're good jobs, right? They're the jobs that the younger population want to work in. Yeah. Developing applications, uh, developing software, uh, and reaching global markets. So I think that's the real opportunity that mobile presents. Mm -hmm. On these jobs, uh, clearly it requires a, a different level of skills. People need to understand what coding is. Mm -hmm. I don't study coding in school, but clearly uh, someday my children might, ha might have to understand that particular concept. Who needs to take the lead with regard to that? Yeah, no, so definitely governments and educators need to switch in that direction. And I think we're seeing that play across the globe, that, that educators are now focusing more on uh, coding and also in creative arts, right? I, I think mm -hmm. there's been a, a big switch uh, to this sort of STEM, uh, so science, technology, engineering, math uh, kind of focus. Um, I, I've heard recently that you know people are starting to add the arts back in there, saying, "Well, actually, we need the creativity to make all of this work together." Wow. Uh, so, so I think that's a switch that educators need to make. I, I think the growing base of these little incubation centres, where you bring these coders, these engineers, these mathematicians, but also these artists together, are actually the centres that are driving a lot of innovation and creating jobs in the future. Is content king when it comes to your offering uh, for the, in the mobile economy? Yeah, I think so, right? I think, I think the applications on there, the content, uh, the information, and again, the local language is really, really important. Mm -hmm. uh, so developing content locally for the local population, letting people consume information in the language they're familiar with, uh, is, is absolutely key and, and, of course, a great job enabler. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm imagining there might be a chief executive of a multinational, of a small or medium enterprise who might be watching the show uh, and is based in the sub-Saharan African environment. What should they be learning from the GSMA report uh, in order to make sure that they remain relevant in 2020 sure. and beyond? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I think we use this, this expression that, um, you know, mobile is everything. Uh, it, to come back to that point, uh, I think uh, as a business, you must have a mobile strategy. Uh, you must think mobile first. Everything you offer has to have a mobile component if it's going to be successful in the market in the long run. So I would encourage people to always think, hey, how is this service or this information I'm developing going to be effectively consumed over the mobile, uh, the mobile channel uh, as a number one thing? I think the other you know, point I think is worth making here is we, we have an expression that, that I stole uh, shamelessly from AT&T in the US who said that there isn't a device out there that isn't made better uh, by the addition of mobile technology. So everything yeah. in your life, if you think of all of those devices you use and you consume that people are producing, the addition of mobile to it uh, allows you to create data, capture data, enhance services and make things better. So again, it, it's really mobile is everything um, and pulling all of that information together and letting people use it uh, becomes the future. Mobile is everything. Given the fact that Sub-Saharan Africa, as we said in the introduction to this conversation, is only third to Europe as well as Asia Pacific, mm. what can we be learning from those two particular regions and look to deploy here? Yeah, so I think the positives, I would, I would look to Asia and the speed of deployment, uh, the speed of rolling out 
high-speed services, 3G, 4G services. Um, you know, Korea is an amazing case study where you have almost a 100% population coverage of 4G services. Wow. Um, just decided they wanted to lead in this space and have pushed really, really hard. Um, and of course, we'll be one of the first to deploy 5G services. Um, but even across the, the Asia region, there is a huge push to get these services out into the market and get people consuming them and, and a realization that that will drive economic growth going forward. Uh, I think for Sub-Saharan Africa, sorry, I should have talked a little bit about Europe. I, I think Europe is, is probably an opposite story. It was an early leader in mobile, mm. did really, really well early on. We now have too much competition in Europe. Uh, it's hard to make the business case. Um, people are struggling to make the investment to build out the 4G and 5G networks. So, so that's an area that really needs to improve. Mm -hmm. For Sub-Saharan Africa, yeah, it's a bit of both, right? It's put the incentives in place, let people get building, let's get up to 3G, up to 4G, set some really ambitious targets to get people connected, let innovators use those networks and hopefully create some jobs. So in 2020, and you and I sit down and have this conversation again, I take it uh, it won't air on television first, but maybe <laughs> on a mobile platform like you said. It's exactly the way it should be. <laughs> exactly the way it should be. Michael, thank you so much for your time today and uh, sharing the insights with us from the GSMA report uh, for 2015, which takes a look at the mobile economy in sub-Saharan Africa. As you heard it from our conversation, mobile is everything. If you're not adapting to the environment, then you uh, either adapt or die and uh, prove to be extinct by the year 2020. But uh, ongoing uh, efforts to ensure that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa remains a positive contributor overall to GDP on the continent and worldwide, uh, but mobile economy certainly can be used as an enabler in that environment. Michael, thank you so much for your time today, the uh, Chief Marketing Officer for GSMA, and that brings our special to an end. We'll leave it with the line that mobile is everything. <laughs>